Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I think I will use my first couple of slides to make it clear that it's an honor indeed, not just a perfunctory lip service when I say uh, how gratified I am for this invitation uh, to speak uh, and give the Roger T. Sherman lecture. Uh, Dr. Sherman has uh, made his footprint in many ways. Uh, as mentioned, his major contributions are in trauma care. He presented as a resident uh, at, this, at this Congress was the president, to highlight his trauma contributions, was president of the American Association for the Surgery of Trauma in 1979, president of this organization in 84, 85, and then spent seven years as the secretary director. Uh, but beyond that, my brother, Michael, 11 years my junior, who trained in surgery at Emory under doctors Feliciano, Rizicki, Wood, uh, was, was also thrilled when he heard that I got this invitation. Dr. Uh, Dr. Sherman was the Whitaker Professor of Surgery, uh, and the Emory residents uh, experienced him back during those times uh, at Piedmont Hospital. Uh, my brother finished his training in, in uh, 98 there, and Dr. Uh, Sherman retired in 97. But he had a well-earned reputation for his dedication to resident education, something near and dear to this organization. And uh, Michael told me that Dr. Sherman was one of those that kind of put them at ease in board preparation. He said, uh, take yourself to the patient's bedside. Uh, the questions that you've been asked are certainly something that you've seen before. And so it's a true honor to be asked to uh, give this lecture. And in, in order to pay homage to Dr. Sherman, I'm going to uh, punctuate my talk with hopefully some helpful hints to the residents and also for my colleagues uh, outside of trauma care, try to highlight what I think is uh, unique about trauma care as it relates to uh, disparities. I have a lot to say, nothing to disclose. I want to publicly thank uh, Dr. Britt not only for the invitation but for your talk, your presidential address yesterday. I, I told Dr. Britt I have to go back and add some slides because when she pulled that family in, the tenor and tone of her talk talking about balance, diversity, lifestyle, and you know our lives, our family lives and our work lives are so closely tied, it's, it's a true juggle. So I said, I'm going to have to go back and get some of my, my slides also. <laughs> That's the first lesson of residents. If you got a, a, a cute kid photo, make sure you show that photo early on to get the, get the audience on your side. Most of them will say, ooh, ah. Uh, some of the more perceptive people will say, ooh, ah, uh, hell, look at that slobber ruining the upholstery on, on, the, on the sofa. But uh, you know, Michael uh, is our only child, and he's got a mom who's a primary care physician who's into wellness and gluten-free and paleo diet and the hyperbaric chamber in the basement and a dad that says, well, exercise will uh, overcome the ills in dietary moderation. So the poor kid's probably going to live to be about 200. But uh, <laughs> Ma's done a good job because by the time he was 11, 12, 13, something's happening to his growth or, or either that or I started getting shorter. But in all seriousness, it, it is a great tribute when you're given a presidential address and your three kids are sitting right up there in the front. That's one thing. But at age 16, 14, and 12, I mean, that's the age where kids start to tell you to go to hell. And here the <laughs> kids are sitting up there. It was a wonderful thing. So it, it tugged at my heart. And um, that's not a high school graduation picture. That's an eighth grade graduation picture. And so, Dr. Sharp, I don't know what I'm going to do after 14 years of nine and under, Pop Warner football, his, his last uh, play in 13 and under was in the state championship game where they won in Raven Stadium, and his last high school play was beating their arch rival Gilman in overtime, and his last college play was a catch with 35 seconds left to beat Morgan State, and he's out in Carson right now chasing that dream for the combine workout before he's got to get a real job. So it's, it's a thrill to be able to... Uh, give this to an organization that is into balance between work and family. Now, I'm going to borrow a, a mantra, a question that Dr. Julie Freischleich, who inherited me as her chief of trauma when she became the chair at Hopkins uh, for a retreat that we had. She asked each division chief to make their presentations in their division about things that make you excited about coming to work. And so I'm going to start out with a 25-year story, uh, almost a quarter century ago to the day Los, the Los Angeles Times took interest in an article that we published out of uh, Los Angeles County of Hospital uh, in Archives of Surgery regarding the organization of a dedicated trauma service at this huge, busy trauma center where I trained in surgery and subsequently was on the faculty uh, for four years. 
And uh, we thought that would make us kind of the golden children, you know. And my sophistication, in quotes, about outcomes and trauma had to do with access. You build a good trauma team and a good trauma center, and you'll improve outcomes, so we thought. And uh, we got, we thought, some great PR out of that article that was published and that below-the-fold front-page story in the LA Times. And not four months later, four months later, the health commission, the head of the health commission, not a public health person, a chief financial officer, decided it might be a good idea to overcome the hundreds of millions of dollars of deficit in Los Angeles County, the largest county in the country at the time, would be the ninth largest state if it was a state, by closing LA County Hospital. And of course, the biggest uproar to that, its impact on outcomes, came as much from uh, the surrounding centers that would have been inundated by the sorts of patients that they were poorly equipped to handle. And so there was a community response and out there on the front steps of Los Angeles County Hospital, there we were. Next, next uh, lesson, residents, when you had given a talk before, a community organization and rousing activism, don't hold up a paper and say the data says and the, the evidence shows, you know, so my wife calls this my angry black man talk, but <laughs> at, the, at the time we thought you have a good hospital, you people have access, they'll do better. I moved to Baltimore now, East Baltimore, level one trauma center there, and you have to, back at the time when I was there, you had to published these perfunctory papers that said, here we are, if we dedicate our trauma system, we improve outcomes, and that's kind of what we show. But I want to share with you the two most important studies in terms of shaping my perspectives and my updated opinions about trauma care uh, from my days there at Johns Hopkins. In 2004, I was on call when a patient with a gunshot wound, multiple gunshot wounds to the torso, the scrotum, and the thigh came in, hypotensive, markedly tachycardic, lethargic due to his uh, low cerebral perfusion from his low blood pressures, soft abdomen, but a huge scrotal hematoma, thready pulses, decreased breath sounds bilaterally, initial placement of a right chest tube that returned over a liter of blood, over 500 cc's from the left chest tube, a large uh, venous access in his groin en route to the operating room where we have a seven floor elevator ride. Uh, I'm going to rush them up. I don't like to intubate the, if they're talking and breathing, different talk for another day, the penetrating chest injuries. I like to decrease that time frame between positive pressure intubation if the lung has been uh, penetrated, uh, particularly if they're hypotensive. So we go upstairs, get them intubated, turn them, and we start a right thoracotomy 28 minutes after he came in. We're going to have the urologist come in for scrotal expiration uh, regarding that gunshot wound there. Our anesthesiologist had an A-line in and pretty clearly um, documented the defects that he has, and he's in trouble pretty early on. And within that first hour, he has a pH that gets as low as 7.03. Some of that respiratory, by the way, and not helped by us having to drop the lung uh, to gain uh, hemorrhage control. Hemoglobin that gets as low as 4.4 and 3.0 uh, during his first 90 minutes of the operation before we finally get control and things start to turn around in that hour and three quarters and two hours after surgery begins. So this is a touch and go sort of situation uh, where we use, we've been using now over 20 years, uh, this GIA instrument in the lung where we slide one limb of the, of the device through the entry and exit wound of the lung, fire it, divide it, and by definition the bullet tract is now filleted open. Next lesson, residents, if you do something like this, don't say, well, we just fired open the tract and over the disrupted airways and disrupted vessels which are created by the bullet tract. Come up with a famous name like pulmonary tractotomy for hemorrhage control. <laughs> Sounds a lot more elegant than in the middle of the night you try not to have the gases and the bubbly blood bubble up in your face. But it facilitates uh, hemorrhage control without having to do major lobectomy or, God forbid, pneumonectomy for trauma, more papers than survivors after that dreaded operation. Um, and so that's what we did. Uh, and. Then our GU colleagues come in and, and find that his left uh, testicle is totally destroyed by that transcrotal gunshot wound, and five-sixths of his right testicle had to be debris mount, which means he's left with one-twelfth of his testicular mass. 18 units of blood. You see the multiple units, FFP and plasma, and I'm setting the stage. Residents, you have a mortality. Make sure you come with all the data when you go to m and conference to explain why your patient died, right? This patient's in trouble, the surgical oncology literature, the transplant literature, the trauma literature speak to, on a multivariate logistic regression fashion, 
uh, speak to the risk associated with transfusions. And this patient with this hypotension, 18 unit blood loss, severe hemorrhagic shock, uh, is in trouble. Uh, but things start to turn around. We, he gets off the table, and by 2 o'clock in the morning after GU has done their thing, we finished our part of the operation. He's stabilized in terms of his hemoglobin. His base deficit is improving. And he's back in the operating room, and at 4 o'clock in the morning, we have uh, surprising stability. He's uh, starting to diurese. He gets extubated at 10 o'clock in the morning. Why does this patient have a right to do so well, despite all these risk factors? Uh, which brings me to the next lesson. You know, I'm a kind of an old school dad when it comes to, comes to, uh, comes to a football cheering for my son. You don't see on his videos a lot of dancing in the end zone and all that stuff. You know, you see him hand the ball to the ref. Act like you've been there before. Act like you're not surprised by success. But I must admit, just among we friends, Dr. Feliciano, we had rounds, and we saw that this patient was extubated, diuresing, chest tube output low. We took the team off of the ICU into a small conference room, and we start jumping around, high-fiving everyone. <laughs> Don't let your other trauma patients see you just so excited that your patient didn't die. That's not, that's not good for the brand. But when you look at this patient's post-operative testosterone, and know the half-life of testosterone, it becomes clear that his peak physiologic insult of hemorrhagic shock coincided with a dramatic decrease of circulating testosterone. Shame on my female colleagues for what you're thinking right now. <laughs> I'm not suggesting orchiectomy is to reduce the incidence of trauma with its aggressiveness or the <laughs> impact of trauma. But perhaps there's something that we can use with those data. This patient was ready to leave the hospital in three days. And it wasn't clear to me whether or not he was going to die the night that he was shot. What is it about this patient that gives him the right uh, to do so well? And what's going to be different between him uh, and the next patient? Now, I become a cheerleader at this point for outcomes research. Because without it, without these large databases and their robustness, I would just be saying to you, this is the most interesting case I've ever had, and that's the end of it. I've had plenty of patients with trans torso gunshot wounds, dead on arrival bullets to the heart, the cava, the pulmonary vessels, the aorta. I've had a lot of other patients with gunshot wounds to the chest who get in and out of the hospital with this the chest tube. Here's a patient who has potentially lethal injuries, 18 unit blood loss, and, and yet at the same time, his pattern of injury creates a dramatic decrease in circulating testosterone, concomitant with his physiologic impact. I'll never have a patient like that again. And so what can we make of, of this patient? The basic scientists have taught us now for over 25 years that female rats subjected to experimental hemorrhagic shock do better than male rats. Castrated male rats do better than non-castrated male rats. Who came up with that idea to do that study? Female rats, estradiol blocked female rats do worse than non-estradiol blocked female rats. The sum total of these studies suggest to us that androgens are responsible for the immunosuppression after trauma hemorrhage in males, while female sex steroids exhibit immunoprotective properties after trauma and severe blood loss. It's clear to us in rats, and it's funny, after the fact, we kind of can come up with ways to justify it, right? Tele teleologically, it makes sense. The survival of a species relies on female fertility, which is defined by cyclical hemorrhage. Perhaps we should not be surprised that females tolerate major hemorrhage uh, better than males. But let me suggest that now that we have these large databases, we might have the ability to see if, in fact, there's similar, we can prove similar sort of observations with humans. The Pediatric Trauma Registry has data from 93 centers, 50,000 patients in it, with uh, demographic information, anatomic in injury severity information, physiologic injury severity information, and allows us to compare outcomes of patients uh, adjusting for multiple variables that we know affect your likelihood of surviving major trauma. Why do we need such a huge database? You have to have 50,000, you lose 8% of your data, you have 46,000 patients with complete data. It co you cone all the way down to just 700 patients who are not dead on arrival, who have severe shock, critically injured children, uh, who have a potential to die from their injuries. 
and dividing them to the pre-adolescents with the average onset of menses in this country at age 12, dividing the outcomes of pre-adolescents and comparing them to their, their, their adolescent counterparts. And we see when we do such a comparison that the 24% reduction uh, in risk of death for girls, critically injured little girls, does not achieve statistical significance because you see that 95% confidence interval could be anywhere from a 47% decrease risk to a 10% increase risk. In pre-adolescence, the same thing, the 18% decrease in risk of death does not achieve statistical significance. But after age 12, when boys and girls start to physiologically look different, is where we see a 62% reduction in the risk of death among critically injured girls, and this achieves statistical significance. When we go to the National Trauma Data Bank, all ages, nearly one and a half million patients in this early iteration of NTDB, two-thirds are males. Again, only about 3% of these patients meet the criteria for serious injury, patients not dead on arrival, the potential of dying from the seriousness of their injuries, and we look at the extremes of age, under the age of 12, over the age of 65, where hormonal differences between male and female are less dramatic. We do not see a statistically significant difference in the, uh, in the benefit of females, survival benefits seen among females. Only in between those, where the 14% reduced risk of death is seen, uh, female benefits of improved survival. Now, trauma hemorrhage, 10 units of blood, uh, hemorrhagic shock happens to be largely a, a male disease, an over 90% male disease. I've been asked, are you suggesting that you transiently block the testosterone receptors or augment the the estrogen. Uh, you know, the urologists have been giving drugs like flutamine for years for uh, advanced prostate cancer, for example. And uh, perhaps we, uh, for the same 10 unit blood loss that some of the military studies are re evaluating uh, recombinant factor seven or so, might be the same criteria when someone reaches that threshold, uh, transient receptor blockade. But in my mind, uh, this overwhelming evidence seen in rats uh, has become more pronounced to me seen in humans. And I think that uh, we're at the point where uh, the basic science and clinical evidence for gender-based disparities, a physiologic basis for outcome disparities, a gender-based, hormonal-based uh, explanation for female superiority as it re relates to trauma hemorrhage survival. Uh, and I think we're at the point where the evaluation of short-term androgen blockade and selective uh, critically injured patients is upon us. We'll never have a registry from a single institution or even a single state. We'll have those types of patients without a national registry. We'll never have a study. We could bring the 20 busiest trauma centers in America together, and it'd take us another 25 years uh, to do such a study. And I think we're at that point when we decide we want to give these massive vitamins, maybe a little growth hormone, maybe, you know, the burn surgeons have taught us a little bit about some of these uh, anabolic uh, steroids, but certainly in the patients that have bled to a certain, to a certain level, it's time to consider transient testosterone blockade. However interesting or, or controversial that may be, I think it's even more challenging when this issue of socioeconomic-based outcome differences in trauma care comes up. And so I'll start by telling you a story about when President George W. Bush visited us at, at Hopkins, the first year of his administration, when he was interested in a uh, prescription drug benefit bill, he came to Hopkins to uh, advocate for it. And you know, when the president travels in advance, the White House nursing office will travel, and they wanted to talk to the chief of trauma and look at the, they decided, well, God forbid, if something were to happen while the president's there, he's right there in your institution, so we'll have you take care of them. So show us your resuscitation area, your ICU beds, your blood bank. And so I gave them the tour. And I guess because I did, I scored an invitation to President Bush's presentation that day. I was on call that day. And shortly after the president left, ladies and gentlemen, keep your seats, let the president leave. Shortly after the president left, I left, the trauma pager goes off. Isn't it funny how your mind plays tricks on you? You've been You've been just consumed with thoughts of everything going well while the president's there. And literally minutes after he walks out, gunshot wound to the flank. And for a split second, you're, you say, oh, God, please don't let it be. 
Well, relax, the president, could do, it would have been in all the papers, so it, it, it wasn't the president. It was a 16-year-old from the East Baltimore who had a gunshot wound to his flank and a renal artery injury. I took out his left kidney. He had the same surgeon, anesthesiologist, operating room, blood bank, ICU bed, ICU nurse that the president of the United States would have had had he been shot that day. And so if you were to ask me in 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, are there socioeconomic-based differences in trauma outcomes? That's, that's, heck no, I would have told you this story. No way. We do the same that we do for a 16-year-old kid from the hood that we would have done for the president of the United States. I know there's no differences. Well, uh, next lesson, you know, surround yourself with super smart people. These, uh, the co-authors on this paper, Marie Crandall, a uh, shout out to her, who moderated the session yesterday. The other five, the five co-authors here, I, I recruited all of them to faculty. I, I was successful four out of five. Four out of five is not bad, but they all went on to great things. Uh, Dr. Hader is the dean of an outstanding medical school in Karachi, Pakistan. Dr. Chang is at Mass General. Dave Efron is the chief of trauma and head of the state COT in Maryland. Elliot Howe, president of East. Marie Crandall, they're, they're doing great things. So that's the lesson. Surround yourself with great people. And this is the data that was generated again from NTDB nearly 377,000 critically injured patients whose outcomes and risk of death are stratified by uh, race, ethnicity, and by insurance status. Using a, using a white insured patient as the baseline, we see a progressive and statistically significant rise in the risk of death as we go from white to black to Hispanic among insured, and even higher risk of death as we go from white to black to Hispanic uninsured. But looking at the non-overlapping 95% confidence intervals, compare, for example, the experience of an insured black patient who has an 8 to 33% increased risk of death compared to his white insured counterpart. Compare his experience with that of a white insured patient. You see that the, a white, excuse me, white uninsured patient, the black insured patient has a better survival in this data set than the white uninsured patient. Multiple other papers over the next five years, I will tell you that insurance status trumps race, ethnicity, gender, mechanism of injury. It's the single uh, most reliable prognostic factor predicting outcomes following trauma care. Why? In my own department, our theme was pursuit of academic and clinical excellence around surgical disease where outcome disparities exist. And like many of you, we've described that in transplant, vascular, cardiac, cancer care. And yet, I would argue that all of those, all of those areas has something to do with access, which was the level of my understanding 19, 20 years ago. Something to do with access. But for my entire career, I've not once known the insurance status of a trauma patient rolling in the door when I'm on call, uh, and a critically injured Uninsured patient gains access to the system every bit as quickly as a critically injured insured patient. So why is it that we see insurance status as a single most predictive factor? So we know what we know. We see these differences by insurance status. Questions will come up, well, maybe black patients be experiencing, more likely to experience gunshot wounds and knowing that penetrating trauma is more lethal than blunt trauma. Maybe there's some overlap to help explain that. Shout out to Wendy Green. She was the first author in this paper looking at that question. And we compare the experience of blunt insured patients, to blunt uninsured. We see a, a, a 70 to 85 percent higher mortality amongst the uninsured. And this number goes from blunt insured to, for example, penetrating uninsured five and a half times greater mortality. But both among blunt trauma and penetrating trauma, the insured population compared to their uninsured counterparts have a better survival. So it's something other than the mechanism of injury. And to further elucidate it in a, in a most uncomfortable way, I would say that this actuarial survival, my colleagues in, in cancer care are more used to that than we are. Uh, the oncologists will talk about actuarial survival in pancreatic cancer out to two years or colon cancer out to five years, breast cancer out to 10 years. But for us in trauma, we go out to 14 days. Right? We, we, we don't have that long a attention span. We compare the outcomes of, of whites to minority white patients 
in this same data set, following it out for 14 days, have a slight but significant improved survival compared to their minority counterparts. But we see it at the very first day, suggesting that there's something in that pre-hospital phase, something that they bring to the table to explain these differences that stay relatively parallel going out to 14 days. When we compare the outcomes, we said women do better, but we see that superiority from day one. And while it opens up a little bit, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't open up much. The next slide that I'll show comparing insured to uninsured is what I always say is the most uncomfortable slide that I have in any talk that I give. A dramatic difference between insured and uninsured patients that's seen on the very first day of this data set that only grows more disparate as we go out 14 days, raising uncomfortable questions for all of us in medicine about are we doing something different with the insured versus the uninsured. A, a, uh, a non-physician asked me the question when I get, gave, this, uh, gave this presentation before a sub, subcommittee group in Congress. Doc, what's going on in the hospital? What are you doing? What's going on with these uninsured? Why is that happening? You know, I, it's a tough question. It's a fair question, but it's a pretty tough question. Uh, raising issues of bias, differential care, and all sorts of things. But this one now, we've described it up and down, and now here we are. We have a hypothesis. We know what we think. As we, we, know, we know, we believe that insurance is just a surrogate for having a primary care doctor, knowing your blood pressure, your lipid profile, your hemoglobin A1C. Uh, we know from the Affordable Care Act that seven years after its passage that use of Medicaid patients, of Medicaid clinics filling prescriptions went up dramatically. And so health behaviors change, and these are the things you bring to the table the night you're shot or stabbed or in a motor vehicle crash. Um, and so we call it, don't steal this, we call it the, the protoplasm theory. You know, is, is, are your patients now, insured patients, more equipped to sustain the rigors of trauma? And now let's look at it from a statewide basis. 33 states accepted the Medicaid expansion following the Affordable Care Act of 2010. But so by 2017, we had 17 states that didn't, providing us an opportunity at a state basis to pursue registries, comparing observed to expected mortality among patients within a given state and uh, comparing pre and post. You don't have to immunize all 30 first graders in a class to, with, with herd immunity to protect uh, the classroom from vaccination. And so does, is there a similar observation to be seen when a state such as Kentucky goes from 17% uninsured to 6% uninsured uh, seven years later versus a state like Georgia, which goes from 18% to 16% did not accept the Medicaid expansion. We know what we don't know. We believe that injury, more so than any other disease, is the area where we should study to try to fully understand the benefits of, of having insurance, because it's not explained by access. And uh, you know, our civil discourse is eroded to the point where not much is gonna happen this year, but after the dust settles, and it's got to settle at some point. Uh, we are the ones that need to inform policymakers about the nuances of insurance care that is, that is even the most important prognostic factor in an area such as trauma care where insurance status does not stop you from gaining rapid access if you're critically injured. And so uh, we know what we don't know. We don't know what happens when what was anticipated to be 20, 27 million or so Americans uh, over, se over seven to 10 years, moving from the ranks of the uninsured to the insured, do you inherit the health benefits automatically? Are there certain behaviors or a certain amount of time that are necessary? And uh, so our pursuit is uh, to, to try to follow what we don't know, two things, two hypotheses we wanna pursue. Does a state that moves uh, after increasing their insurance co coverage, does a state show an impact, a dramatic impact in their uh, O to E survival rates, a state that accepted the Medicaid expansion and compared with a similar demographic state that did not. Uh, and then the question comes up, why is there racial ethnic differences among insured groups? 
Why does, why does among the insured, white versus black versus Hispanic, a growing risk of death and the same thing among the uninsured? Is there somewhere where we could study that? Is there a, a health system that has white, black, Hispanic patients who have similar access, who have not only access to care, but mandatory care, who have a monolithic lifestyle, who have protocol-driven care given to them, should they, despite all these positive prognostic factors of being insured, still are at high risk for critical traumatic injury? Of course there is the military. And what happens if we look at that military registry <laughs> and compare racial ethnic differences. We are at the point now where we've described the differences up and down the wazoo, if you will. I, I want to run a spotlight on a study coming out of President Britt's institution where an acute care service using the Virginia registry has shown to decrease outcome disparities among patients with complicated diverticular disease. In the, in the military, acute care surgical conditions Racial ethnic disparities have been seen to diminish. Is the same thing to be seen in trauma care? You know, this, so, and of course we will never have uh, everything in civilian care that uh, the same features that we see in military care, but you know, the industry folks call it best, best practices. If, we, if those differences diminish, I think that would be an important contribution to our understanding. And if they persist, race being a, a social construct, it raises a whole host of other questions. So I always say to our research associates and our residents, nothing like a question that no matter whether the answer is yes or no, it's an important contribution. So don't steal my idea, anyone. This is, <laughs> I've used the title, We Know What We Don't Know, uh, to try to jazz up you know, the uh, background and significance, specific aims, and the justification for support to pursue these. So, so we want to, compare state registries of similar states, one that accepted the Medicaid expansion versus one that didn't and let it serve as its own control for pre and post. Uh, the first, uh, I'll tell you a little story, the first uh, grant that we put in was being reviewed the day that the Congress was voting on repealing Obamacare, came within one vote of getting repealed. And the comments that we got is, does this matter anymore and this is gonna be a moot point? I would argue that it becomes more important than ever. Because, I, because we are the ones that have to inform health policymakers about this, this uh, ubiquitous impact of insurance access, even in a disease where insurance access does not restrict care. And then the, the, uh, the Joint Theater Trauma Registry has some holes as, as it relates to demographics, but may still provide a very promising option to try to address that other issue of why even among insurance or uninsured groups, we see racial ethnic differences. And so we know who's at risk for a higher, higher mortality following trauma. We know who does better. We know of a physiologic example, and we think we know of a socioeconomic example. We postulate that, uh, that insurance status is just a surrogate, so we think we know, and we know what we don't know. We don't know every aspect, every nuance of being insured that explains why no matter what the disease, even a disease that typically uh, has, has, is blind to insurance status during that early resuscitation, why we still see it as a powerful prognostic predictor uh, for outcomes following trauma care. And so I would conclude, ladies and gentlemen, with the basic science and clinical evidence for gender-based disparities and outcomes following major traumas is, is indisputable. Our science now has improved to the point where we're now poised to deal with the difficult topic of socioeconomic differences. And so that's what uh, excites me. That's what makes me want to leave that football game and get back to work. That's what makes me excited about coming to work. Thank you for your attention and for the honor of giving the Roger Sherman Lecture. Thank you very much.